I'm Ben Ripond. Today is March 29, 2022. One thing I want to remind you of is that as we look at the economy, we see the economy as fragile and in some cases broken. We see all kinds of issues around the world, um, certainly in Europe and even in America. And I'll cover some of that. But first, I'm going to cover the stock market. And more particularly, I'm going to cover portfolio design, really where most people live, is how does this affect my portfolio, my investments? And I want to remind you that the that investments, stock and bonds, don't necessarily connect with the economy. They may completely disconnect. For example, during the past two weeks, from March 14 to present, it's approximately two weeks, uh, the stock market has been going up. It had been going down for about two and a half months, just a steady decline down. And now it's began, it has begun a trajectory up. So you may think, well, how did that happen? Because it looks like the news is just as bad as it was, particularly it relates to the economy is just as bad. But the, the issue, I think, and I pointed this out before, the issue is that the market was sensed uncertainty around the war in Ukraine. And because that there was uncertainty there, that sent the market on a steady decline down. A couple of weeks ago, I think investors, particularly institutional investors, began to see some glimmer of hope out in the future that maybe things are going to be resolved there. And that sent the market up. It has not changed our fundamental economy, I don't think, and it may not. We don't really know enough yet to know what's really going to be the outcome of the war. But just that the, the market had begun to be oversold, so it was looking for some reason to go up. But I just want to point out that the market and the economy can be very disconnected. So if you see some good news in the economy or in the market and it doesn't match the economy, realize that can happen. The first thing I want to begin with is what is called the 60-40 portfolio. Another word for this is the buy and hold portfolio. Most of us are familiar with one of those terms. The I saw this article it was on the 60-40 portfolio doesn't work anymore. And I'm going to cite some other sources for this. So I've begun to see uh, articles about this. And I've been saying this for some time. But to, to see this occur in blogs and in the financial press is uh, interesting that uh, others are picking up on this. So when they say this, I'm, I'm going to unpack this a little bit. When they say the 60-40 portfolio doesn't work anymore, what they're saying is that the bond portion, particularly the bond portion of the portfolio, is not working the way it's worked for the past 39 years. And I'll explain that in just a minute. So what you're left with, if you really sort of give up on bonds and say this is just, uh, they, they don't fit inside of the portfolio, they are the 40 of the 60-40. So that's a big portion of the portfolio. And so when I say that, then you're left with, okay, you've got the 60. <laughs> so that's all you've got left. You think, okay, that's still, uh, that's even more volatility and more risk. So... Let's go into this a little bit. I want to explain this and why this is. So if you're in a traditional portfolio put together by a traditional advisor, then uh, you are probably seeing, you per particularly if you've looked over the past, um, probably the last three months, uh, you will have seen uh, abysmal returns or you know pretty bad losses because bonds have not been there to protect against equity risk. So this chart I've shown before, but I want to show it here because it has a place right here. When This is a chart that goes all the way back to 1926 to present. It's a macro chart showing macro cycles. And these are interest rate cycles and uh, showing the, the trend of interest rates and the trend of uh, bond, bond yields and bond prices. 
So the, on the left side where the green arrow and the red arrow begin on the left side of the chart, you will see that is 1946. So the green arrow goes up for 36 years, up to 1982. The red arrow goes down for 46 years to 1982, and then they change places. Then the red arrow goes up, green arrow goes down. So the green arrow that goes up initially, that's interest rates, and in this case, it is actually bond yields. But bond yields track interest rates, and I'll show you that in the next slide. While they are going one direction, the price of the bond that they are connected to and now we have bond funds, same thing, it is declining. So as interest rates and bond yields go up, the price of those bonds goes down and vice versa. So for the last 39 years, from 1982 to 2021, interest rates have been steadily macro coming down. Not a straight line. They go up and down, up and down, but in general direction, they have come down uh, to the very bottom where they were this past year. Correspondingly, the bond prices that they are connected to have risen. So we have been in this period of time for the last 39 years where traditional advisors, traditional portfolios have relied on those increasing values in bonds to be able to offset equity or stock risk. So when stock market goes down, these are there, doesn't prevent the loss, it just cushions it a little bit. So for example, in 2008, the uh, stock market went down about, S&P 500 went down about 56%. In a 60-40 portfolio, just a an example of one, uh, the market went down somewhere between 25 and 35%. That's still a lot. but So they don't completely eliminate that risk, but the stocks did not go all the way down to 56%. So there was a degree of cushioning there. And so that happened in this period of time, this last 39-year period. So the... Uh, this chart shows that uh, we're ready for the next cycle. And the next cycle, uh, we are no now starting to see that interest rates are on their way up. And I'll show you in just a minute. The next slide shows th th this is uh, interest rates. So we, the last slide was on bond yields. And I said that bond yields track interest rates and vice versa. And so... In this chart, you can see it's, it's a long chart. It's a 300 plus year period of time from the Bank of England going back to 1694 to present. So you can see not only this last 75 year period of time from 1946 to present made up of two very large macro cycles, interest rates going way up and interest rates coming way down. Again, think bond yields going way up, coming way down. And of course, bond prices move in the opposite direction. But you can also, to put it in context, before World War II, you can see the degree to which central bank intervention, in this case, the Bank of England, uh, was involved, and then the period of time for 140 years before that where they were not involved. So central banks, in our case, the Federal Reserve, bank uh, has a big part to play in how interest rates go up and how they come down. But here we are at the very bottom of the black arrow, and we are now on our way back up, in my opinion, and in the opinion of Russell Napier, financial historian, that we are in for another long macro cycle of interest rates going up. That doesn't mean they will necessarily take 30 to 40 years to go up. He said a decade to a decade and a half, and I think he was being conservative. It could be beyond that. We don't know. That's all projection. So you could say one to three or four decades, but a long period of time, not two to five years, much longer period of time where interest rates will be going up. 
The next slide shows this is the these are the rate increases, projected rate increases that the Fed and other economists are saying the that interest rates are projected to increase both this year and the next year and beyond. So this only gets us up to 2%. So this is not, uh, you know, if the mean from that previous chart is 5%, 2% is not a lot. Well, you may think, I think, of why has the Fed all of a sudden decided to do something about this? The reason is because they are trapped. They're in a box, and the problem that they have is that if they raise interest rates, yes, that will counter inflation. And that's what these are intended to do, is to counter the rate of inflation. So I do expect inflation to come down. We don't know how far and how long it's going to take for that to have an effect. But they will raise interest rates as long as they have to, to get inflation in check and then to bring it back down. So agreed on that. The unintended consequence, the other part of the equation, which is why they have not done anything before now, is they know that historically when they have raised interest rates, it crashes the economy. If we go back to 1973, 74, or 79 to 82, those are periods of time where the market crashed about 50% because of raising interest, rising interest rates to counter inflation. So I think that while inflation will come into under um, control with these interest rate increases, the result will be a crashing stock market, a crashing bond market, and a crashing economy. And maybe you could even say what has typically gone with that is a crashing real estate market. So as long as they're committed to raising interest rates and pulling to pull inflation down, I don't see any way possible we can avoid um, the crashing uh, economy, stock market, and bond market. And that's why I think the articles related to the 60-40 portfolio is dead because what's happening is that if, if this is going to crash the stock market, then we know that bond yields are going to track the interest rate increases. And what that means is declining bond prices. So the fact that bond, bonds are not there, haven't been there for the last seven months to protect against equity risk. This article came from uh, Seeking Alpha. Uh, it said, forget a stock market crash. The bond market may collapse first, sell TLT. And TLT is the exchange traded fund for uh, long-term government bonds. And the article talks about this exactly what I'm saying, why it is, um, and this makes up a lot of portfolios or a fund or ETF very similar to TLT make up the uh, counter, what's intended to be the counterbalance to equity risk in portfolios. The other article that I saw was on CNBC, and the headline caught my, this is an op-ed piece, the headline caught my attention, traditional 60-40 portfolio has actually reached its expiration date. And so these are the talking points in the article. Bonds are too expensive and too risky. Equities will be volatile in a static equity only portfolio. So if you pull bonds out and say, okay, agreed, they're too risky, then you're left with equities. And an equity only portfolio uh, has a lot of volatility, which is why they have been using bonds. The traditional 60-40 portfolio will earn less than inflation and will offer little protection in an equity sell-off. And finally, investors should avoid owning bonds or bond funds at these interest rate levels. So the traditional, so the, the Fed is in a box. They, they have nowhere to go in order to counter inflation. They have to raise interest rates. The f traditional financial advisor is also in a box because for the last 39 years, they have been taught that bonds are a good counterbalance to stocks or stock funds. Agreed. They are a pretty good counterbalance. 
in a buy and hold portfolio. So they've been able to give uh, investors a buy and hold portfolio and say that bonds or bond funds are going to counter that equity risk and here's how. They have not departed from their belief in that. But I think we're in for a period of time and investors are in for a long period of time where the bonds and bond funds are not going to be there to protect against equity risk. And the, the next big decline, whenever it happens, however it happens, it may be this year, maybe next year, or even beyond, we don't know when, but whenever that happens, we will see how this plays out. Last week, I saw this article by, uh, came out from Ned Davis Research. Ned Davis Research is the preeminent uh, market research company in the United States. They are substantial. They're subscribed to by all the uh, institutional investment firms, uh, investment managers. Uh, they, they do a very good job of analyzing market conditions uh, from every perspective, both in the U.S. and around the world. So when and this, uh, the man that wrote this is Joe Kalich, Kalish, and he's the chief global macro strategist for Ned Davis Research, uh, a very big title. And so when the article said, knowing it's from Ned Davis Research, and it said the golden age of 60-40 portfolios has likely ended. Wow, that was significant. And so as I read the article, again, all of the talking points were very similar to what I've just covered. To give you an example, so I took the exchange traded fund, TLT, to just put it on a chart and show you the level of decline that it has had. Now you can see in here, it doesn't go straight down. There are periods of time where it actually does go up and then it just collapses. But the general direction is down. Why is that? Because interest rates are going up. We've already covered that. The, uh, there are three kinds of bonds that are generally used. Some combination of them is used uh, in a 60-40 portfolio or some kind of a portfolio, diversified portfolio or non-correlated portfolio. And those are government bonds, high quality corporate bonds, and high yield corporate bonds. Those are the three. So this covers the uh, quality government bonds. The next is the high quality corporate bonds for the companies that have the highest credit ratings and you can see what has happened to them. And then this, this is a chart of the high yield bonds, and you can see what's happened to that. Again, periods of time where they go up, but in generally, it's just a collapsing picture where they go down for a long period of time. So if we're looking at a period of a decade to two decades, let's say, uh, this is not gonna be a pretty picture for portfolios that include some portion of bonds. And the older a person gets, the more bonds they have in their portfolio. That's just what financial advisors do. And if you're in a 401k plan or 403b plan, you know that uh, it, many people are in target date funds. Same thing, target date funds, the older you get, the more and more loaded they become with bond funds. You don't see it um, in your portfolio. All you see is the target date fund. But behind that are uh, investments in uh, all kinds of bonds. This is, the, this is not a chart of the price of bonds. This is a chart showing the asset flow out of high yield bonds. So I'm just gonna look at high yield bonds. Where has the money been going since the beginning of 2022, the beginning of the year, about three months ago. This is the flow of assets out of high yield bonds. So the corporate or, or the institutional money has been leaving high yield bonds at this rate. So, which is making my point that they know what's coming. They didn't get out because they're avoiding a three month decline. They got out because they see more coming. The bank exchange traded fund, KBE, is a collection of banks, banking stocks. And typically bank stocks will move up when interest rates go up. 
However, what's and that tracked very closely up until recently. And recently, they started to diverge. I find this very interesting. Bank stocks started to decline while interest rates are still going up. What somehow it is saying is that there's other kind of risk that's associated with bank stocks other than the um, traditional correlation between interest rates and bank stocks. This is a, sh a chart showing the composite value of the stock market. Uh, you could say the total stock market or even just the S&P 500 as it relates to the gross domestic product, GDP, the economic output of the U.S. economy. So the U.S. economy supports the value, should support the value of the stocks that are inside of the economy. They should move generally together. But what this chart shows is there are times where the stocks will actually surge ahead of the underlying economy. Because remember, this is not a chart about stocks. This is a ratio chart. So since the ratio should be correlated, it's not. There are times where the stocks get ahead of the underlying value, and there are times where they fall below the underlying value, which means they're selling at a discount. So you can see from the far right of the chart where we are today. Do you see that little decline at the very end of the chart from the red arrow? That very little decline? That was the last three months. The market went down around 10 to 15 percent. That's what that decline represents. Does it have a long ways to go before it even gets back to the mean? Quite a bit. That's when I talk about equity risk. That's what I'm seeing is equity risk. So again, buy and hold portfolios not only have bond risk, but now you can see the level of stock risk. So this is the 60 side of the 60 portfolio. At some point, if you believe in historical patterns and cycles, at some point that line has got to drop down to the regression line. At some point it's got to go below the regression line. Typically, it overshoots. It overshoots on the downside, and of course it also overshoots on the upside. It never seems to just track where the regression line is. So we, we, stocks have a long way to go down, but we don't know when. And we've seen the last couple of weeks where stocks uh, have been on a surge up. We don't know how long that's going to last. Are we at the beginning of a new trend? We don't know until it actually occurs. We, we certainly, it has begun. Will it follow through and continue? Yeah, we hope so, but we don't know that for sure. This is an interesting chart because this shows over um, since 2011, the green portion of this chart shows the degree of the returns, the S&P 500 returns, 14% of those returns since 2011 are driven by price to earnings ratio expansion. So the degree to which prices have gone beyond the earnings that support those prices, price to earnings ratio, the degree to which it's exceeded that value is represented by the green line. In other words, stocks have way overshot the earnings that support that, and the previous chart shows they way overshot the underlying economy that supports it as well. This is a chart showing the um, degree of onshore and offshore investments. Now, a lot of companies have their uh, business is in the United States. There are other companies that are multinational companies where they, they're a portion of their portfolio, their business is offshore uh, in other countries. The larger the company, the more you can see they are definitely multinational uh, companies and have a lot of offshore holdings and a lot of offshore business. So this shows the kind of companies that the blue line represents the kind of companies 
where their business is focused only in the U.S. The pink line shows those companies whose holdings include offshore uh, business. So by just looking at the onshore offshore aspect, you can see that the U.S. based companies have done better than those non-U.S. based. So for example, if you were to look at the Dow companies, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, uh, those companies primarily have offshore holdings. You look at the S&P 500, quite a bit of those have offshore holdings. I would say they tend to be in the area of value stocks as opposed to growth stocks. So value stocks, I think, have more offshore holdings. And um, so that has been, and we'll see from in future charts, where the value stocks have begun to underperform. And this is another way of saying that. When you take those two lines and you put them into a ratio, a ratio chart, that's what this chart is. It shows the ratio numerator, U.S. based companies, U.S. Uh, doing business solely in the U.S., and uh, denominator, those including the U.S. but doing business also offshore, you can see what that ratio looks like. So it begins to exaggerate that difference, and you can see the degree to which U.S.-based companies are way outperforming, significantly outperforming those that have offshore business interest. The guy by the name of Bob Farrell worked his entire career, 45 years, at Merrill Lynch. He was the ended his career as the head of research at Merrill Lynch. And he is known for, <laughs> he's not known for that 45-year career at Merrill Lynch. What he is known for is he developed over that long career, he developed 10 rules for investing. And they're known as Bob Farrell's 10 Rules for Investing. You can look them up. They're pretty well known. And so as I went through those, I thought there were six of them that are isolated that, have, that are pertinent to today. And it would be good for us to hear those six. So bear with me. I'll read these to you. And just, I'm not going to really comment. I'm just going to let you think about what he's saying here. One, markets tend to return to the mean over time. Excesses in one direction will lead to an opposite excess in the other direction. There are no new eras. Excesses are never permanent. Exponential, rapidly rising or falling markets usually go further than you think but they do not correct by going sideways. Fear and greed are stronger than long-term resolve. And six, when all the experts and forecasts agree, something else is going to happen. We, you undoubtedly know that food prices are up. They're up substantially. Look at what it costs to go shopping. I'm not going to belabor that point. We all have our own personal experiences. We know that part of this is a supply chain shortage or a supply chain issue with cost of transportation, ships in the harbor can unload their freight, uh, various agricultural issues, uh, perhaps some weather-related issues, perhaps even the war in Ukraine which is a, uh, Ukraine is a de and Russia are both definitely uh, substantial producers of wheat and all kinds of commodities. So multiple issues, it's a complex issue, but we know that we are in a supply chain issue and you have probably read that there is a food shortage and more specifically a coming food shortage. And what will that mean to us? This article came uh, from CNN. I, I saw it said the war, war, meaning Russia, Ukraine, has brought the world to the brink of a food crisis. 
It is being talked about both in Europe and in Africa, but in Asia, other parts of the world. Uh, Australia, for sure, because of the natural disasters they faced. Uh, that there are food shortages, and it is projected that those shortages will expand and become even more. In this, uh, if you're interested in uh, what's going on in Israel, uh, there's this uh, blog, uh, Israel 365 News, which is very uh, fo is solely focused on Israel and the impacts in Israel. And it caught my eye, it said, Israel heeds Joseph's advice. Stocks up on wheat for upcoming famine. So Joseph, a character in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, the son of Jacob, the great grandson of Abraham. So he's in Egypt and he is telling the Pharaoh, interpreting his dream and saying, you're going from these years of plenty, abundance, and you're going into seven years of famine. It didn't look like famine, but he said, your dream is telling you that you're headed into famine. So the Pharaoh at that time, he listened to Joseph's advice and began to stockpile wheat, which was their primary source of food, a key, key ingredient in food. And sure enough, the seven years of famine occurred. Joseph ended up getting promoted to the second most, the, the second most powerful uh, person in the country of Egypt, second only to Pharaoh himself, because his interpretation of the dream was precise. When I read the article, and by the way, this is what it says in Genesis 41, 36, let that food be a reserve for the land for the seven years of famine which will come upon the land of Egypt, so that the land may not perish in the famine. So I read on the article, the Secretary of Transportation for Egypt. So this, I moved from kind of this biblical reference over to a secular reference. The Secretary of Transportation for the country of Egypt has made a decision. I think she might be thinking, you know, <laughs> about their history. There's something coming here. So she has made a decision to allow ships coming into, into um, Israel priority in unloading. So any ship that's waiting to unload its uh, freight uh, is put to the side and allowed ships carrying food priority. And Israel is preparing itself for famine because they see something coming. This is going, the impact of Russia and Ukraine is going to have a definite impact throughout Europe, and it's definitely going to have an impact in Egypt or in uh, Israel. And Israel is preparing itself for maybe a period that goes back a few thousand years. Thinking of Russia, we, we, a lot of the images we have in, uh, from the press whatever our news source is, the images relate primarily to Ukraine. But I did some digging on what's going on in Russia. And this article appeared, Russia's ruble, their currency, worth less than one cent in US currency, less than one cent after the West tightens sanctions. It dropped about 50%, it dropped half. So let's just say it was one, it's one cent. That means it was two cents. <laughs> it dropped in half from two cents down to a cent. Not, not very good news, but either way, it's not good. And uh, so their currency is uh, in shambles. Their economy is in shambles and people, and who is this hurting? Is it hurting the uh, ruling class elite? Absolutely not. It's hurting the common person in Russia. And whatever's going on in this country, is it hurting our, uh, the elites in our country? Of course not. 
it's hurting the average person. Russians are buying so much gold amid the ruble's collapse that the central bank, central bank in Russia, halted its own purchases from banks. So the bank said, uh, we're not gonna compete with the Russian citizen. And so they allow the citizens who are buying all the gold they can get their hands on. They're paying about 50% more than we pay in this country. If we're paying $2,000 an ounce for gold, let's just use gold as an example. If they're paying uh, $2,000, we're paying $2,000 per ounce, they're, the equivalent in Russia is $3,000 an ounce just because of the status of their currency. But why do they do that? I mean, $3,000 an ounce? I mean, that's a lot. How many ounces are you going to be able to accumulate? They fear the reason this is out there, I believe, is that the Russians and the Ukrainians fear the collapse, the complete collapse of their currency. They've seen it before. And we have not seen it. And But I think this is a message for us that if their currency collapses, they're not the leading currency in the world, but I mean, that is not good news for everywhere else. This article from CNBC, Russia Central Bank, equivalent of our Federal Reserve Bank, more than doubles interest rate to 20% to boost the sinking ruble. So the sinking ruble, what that has to do is just like the sinking dollar, think in terms of this. Why is the dollar going down in purchasing power? Because of inflation. How do you counter inflation? You raise interest rates, remember that? So what have we done? What has our central bank, the Federal Reserve Bank done? They have raised interest rates from what? From a quarter of 1% to one half of 1%. One half. And projected over this year to get maybe to 2%. Maybe next year we'll get up to two and a half. They started a month or two ago, started at nine and a half percent and have now raised rates to 20 percent. Will they crush inflation? Big time. That will crush inflation and it will crush their stock market and it will crush um, the economy. So the people in Russia know that. I think that's the reason why there is a flight to safety and people are looking to buy gold as some kind of safe haven for what they believe is coming. So in the um, world of uh, food, I was looking at what's going on in China and um, the U.S. related to our food supply, and there are farms that are uh, being sold to China, and the article talks about China. It didn't say Chinese business people, Chinese agriculture companies, it said China, which makes me think that it means the Chinese government is buying farms. The figure I saw was that 192,000, actually this article, 192,000 acres of U.S. farmland is now owned by China. So if we hit a food crisis bigger than the crisis we have now, a further constriction in food supply, food prices, and they own 192,000 acres, which is not the majority of the farmland by any stretch, where do you think that food is going to go? Do you think it's going to go to Americans or to China? Makes me wonder. Okay, now we're going to jump over to the stock market. So the stock market, as I said, for the last two weeks has been going up, and that's good news. Two weeks ago, when we looked at this dashboard, uh, we could see everything on the far right, all four columns were red. Now, the four columns are the, the, ratio, the, the relationship of the exchange-traded fund for the S&P 500, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, the NASDAQ 100, and 
the Russell 2000. That covers pretty much a broad spectrum of types of companies in the United States. And the last two lines relate to the uh, developed foreign countries and the underdeveloped foreign countries. It was all red two weeks ago. Well, that has begun to change. So as of yesterday, the there are more green dots showing that these indexes are above the 20, the 50, or 100 or 200 day moving averages. So the movement of more green uh, is a positive sign that the indexes are starting to move up. The red dots show that those indexes are in fact still below their, the last three lines, the 50 day, the 100 or 200 day moving averages. When you take the U.S. economy or the U.S. stock market and you break it down into sectors, the market, and let's just say the S&P 500, is comprised of 11 broad sectors. Things like technology, utilities, transportation, retail, etc. Those 11 uh, sectors each has an index and each ha they have funds and they have ETFs that track the, those particular sectors. So this is just looking at the ETF that tracks those sectors. The ETF is listed on the far left. Next to it is the description. And then the changes for the past week, month, quarter, etc. And then are they, with a green dot, are they above the 20, 50, 100 day, 200 day moving averages? Or are they below, meaning a red dot? So you can see from the US economy that there is a, a move, and this was all red, or not all red, all except energy was red. <laughs> energy was up, but the, all the rest were red two weeks ago. Then you can see that uh, they are moving uh, in a positive direction and have done so quite a bit during the past couple of weeks. This is a chart showing the, this is through uh, yesterday, uh, uh, March 28th. You can see that the, the movement of the S&P 500 represented by the ETF SPY. And it was going in an upward direction until the last two and a half months and then it declined, uh, you can see that on the right side of the chart, below its 20 period moving average. Each move in the chart represents one week and the entire period is one year. However, when you look at the last two, and two, week, or two weeks, you can see that the S&P 500 has in fact moved up very quickly. And is that the beginning of a trend? It looks like it, but we don't know yet. Uh, we began, uh, we use a methodology with various indicators. Our, we began uh, going back into the market. We were out or mostly out of the market uh, for that two and a half month period. And the, we began moving back in three days after our indicators starting to turn positive three days after the market began up moving up and then uh, we quickly became fully invested in the market, which is where we've been for the past week or so. So, but that represents this. Uh, fortunately, we've been able to avoid a lot of the down uh, turn in the market and it participated. Uh, we're very pleased with the amount of participation we've had on the upside. Um, is that gonna last? We don't know. <laughs> we just follow our indicators. And if they say there is strength in the market, we're gonna stay in the market. And um, when there isn't, we'll start to phase back out of the market. This star chart is a, is a relationship. It's a ratio chart showing the direction of growth companies, growth companies, Apple, Google, Microsoft, etc. growth companies compared to the broader index, the S&P 500. So when the chart is moving up, it is showing that the growth companies are outperforming SPY or the S&P 500. When it is declining, it shows that the S&P 500 
is outperforming the growth stocks, or said another way, growth stocks are underperforming the S&P 500. So it's not, uh, they could both be going down. In this case, they were both going down in the far right of the chart. It's just that the growth companies were grow going down further and faster than the S&P 500. Then you notice at the bottom of the chart, at the very bottom, I circled it, the, the last couple of weeks that they, the growth stocks have started to move back up. And so we, when we got in back in the market, we got into the growth side of the market, not the value side of the market. So we are um, moving in an upward direction in the side of the market, which has the greatest strength. And that's what that shows. This is a relationship, again, a ratio chart, showing the relationship of small cap stocks or the small cap index, IWM, the Russell 2000, the relationship of IWM to SPY, the S&P 500. And so for a year, you can see that the small cap stocks have underperformed, whether the market, the stocks are going up or they're going down, it is doing worse than, generally speaking, the S&P 500, and nearly all of that time has stayed below its 20-period moving average. Pretty interesting. We've talked before about the long-term government bond, TLT, or the bond ETF, TLT, and this shows, this is not a ratio chart, this is just TLT. It's a 24-month period, not a 12-month period, and it is a weekly chart. So you can see, and I kind of showed this earlier in a previous slide, you can see the direction of TLT. It, is continue, it has had two long periods down, a short term up, and then just a collapse. It has not been there when it has been needed uh, to counterbalance equity risk. Now I'm gonna show gold and then silver, and then I'm gonna show the ratio between gold and silver. So you, and it's kind of all over the place, but you can see the general direction for 24 months for the ETF GLD is in an upward direction. And the last couple of days, it has turned back down and it has started to turn uh, negative, but I don't know if that's short term or long term. Uh, my son, uh, Preston, uh, describes to me, he said, Dad, the um, gold and silver have higher demand than ever. And I'm thinking of that article about what are they doing in Russia? He said, there's huge demand. And you think, well, why is this thing just going through the roof if there's huge demand? So a lot of people think that. And uh, the, the, the short answer is it's being manipulated. A deeper answer is the banks are trying to accumulate as much as they can. And they're also trying to suppress the prices so that it convinces the average person to not buy gold because buying gold or silver means you have some money outside of the banking system. The banks don't want that. And from what I can tell, the government doesn't want that. So that is your only uh, avenue. Not, not the only avenue, but it's the most, it's the easiest avenue uh, to have money outside of the banking system or the currency system is to own physical gold and silver. This is a 24 month chart, very similar chart uh, for silver. There's a difference between the charts. So I wanna point this out. So when you do a ratio from silver to gold, not gold to silver, but silver to gold. What that means is that if it's going up, any period that goes up, that means silver is in favor. Any period that goes down, whether short-term or long-term, if it goes down, that favors gold. So you can see for the two-year period, silver has generally moved in an upward direction. And for the last year or so, gold, in this case, GLD as a surrogate for gold, has, um, has outperformed silver, which is causing that silver gold ratio to slightly decline. They both have been going up, but long term, silver has outperformed gold. One of the measures of stock market risk is volatility. There is an index that tracks stock market volatility it is called the volatility index. And there's a symbol for it, a stock symbol called VIX, and it's called the VIX. And 
the when, when it is going up, that means there is increasing risk in the market, increasing volatility. So you think of stocks going up. Well, if stocks go up, this is going down and vice versa. So the VIX measured over, this is just a um, three month period of time. So I wanted to just point this out. The volatility index has been declining fairly rapidly and is now down around nine. When I took this screenshot, it was down around 19, 1944. I drew a black line at an area in the chart that it is generally thought that if the VIX, volatility index, is below that black line, let's say 24, 25, that it is favorable to stocks. Stocks are increasing in value and risk has been diminished in the market. And so we're in a period right now of diminishing market risk, regardless of what you see about the economy or the currency or debt or anything else. We are in a period of decreasing volatility in the market as measured by the VIX. Interesting chart. Jump over to Asbury Research. Asbury Research has their Asbury 6 uh, different indicators and those have all been positive for the last week or two, which is again verifying what the VIX shows us as well. This shows the uh, asset flows. This is not a stock chart or the relationship of uh, stock, stock performance. This is a function of where is the money going, the asset flows. And the most, and it's mixed. So some areas are, um, everything is generally positive. However, those that are the most positive are marked in green, that are the most negative are marked in red. So you can see it's kind of all over the place, except this is through Monday, which I think it's actually through Friday, uh, that energy, has been the one sector in the economy of the 11. This is the one sector that has been the most positive for the last week, the last month, and the last quarter. Certainly for the last month and the last quarter. Although as the rest of equities have now started to go up, it is putting pressure on energy and energy has actually started to decline. So it'll be interesting to see next week if this uh, uh, weekly indicator for energy is still green. We don't, we don't know yet. This is the comparison between assets. It's a relative performance, not an asset flow, but a relative performance chart comparing different asset or assets in the market. So I'll just go through this briefly and I just kind of touch on the ones that are all green. So US stocks or bonds? No question, stocks is, you know, they've both been down for the, particularly the last quarter, but stocks have done better than bonds. Uh, large cap or small cap? Large cap, obviously, if you've looked at the other slides, you know, large cap is doing better versus small cap. And then the broad market, the S&P 500 versus the Dow, the S&P 500 has done better and um, value stocks are more out of favor right now. The U.S. or developed markets or U.S. or emerging markets is the third box I've got. And the U.S. is clearly better than those, as you saw from the dashboard. And in the area of bonds, high, they're, these are both negative. But which one is the least negative? High yield or corporate? Uh, high yield is the least negative. And short term or long term bonds, short term is better because it just if, if they're going up, it goes up less. If they're going down, it goes down less. So it's, it's the least worst, I guess you would say. When you compare the US to the world, the boxes that are indicated in green show the uh, kind of overwhelming strength. In other words, is there enough strength to make it a green box or, um, or not? And uh, the ones that are not colored, 
Uh, there is strength, if it says U.S., that means there is strength in the U.S., but not a lot. So the four countries that are stronger than the U.S. in the world of these 24 countries, the ones that are the strongest are Chile, Australia, Mexico, and Brazil. Did you notice the U.S. is not in any of those? And more specifically, did you notice that Europe whether developed countries or Eastern Europe are not here. Not a single one. They're all in Latin America or Australia. I took one of them. I just took the country of Mexico just to give you an example of what this is showing. But I, I looked at all of those four countries, Australia, Brazil, Chile, and, and uh, Mexico. And I just took the country of Mexico, for example, and I just put that on a chart, a relative strength chart, just to show if it's going up, that means it favors Mexico. If it's going down, it favors the U.S. And you can see all the way back to uh, December, November, actually, late November, that the performance of the Mexican ETF or the country of Mexico, EWW, is stronger, that much stronger than SPY representing the U.S. stock market. And all four of those tend to look something similar to this. Gold and silver. As of uh, yesterday, I told you that uh, gold uh, and silver have both just recently uh, been declining. They have been on an upward trajectory, but now they've pulled back the last few days. The current price uh, for gold is 1924, down about less than 1% um, from a week ago. This is as of yesterday, the 28th. And silver, 2507, down 1.5% from a week ago. I think that speaks for itself. The, if if the, uh, there can be resolution to the war in Ukraine, and I think we all hope there would be, there's resolution to that. The one thing that's facing us right now is inflation. And the issue after inflation is going to, in my opinion, is going to be deflation because, which means decreased asset prices in uh, stocks, real estate, in my opinion, bonds, and um, uh, job losses, you know, back into a recession. Uh, hopefully not a bad one, but that's the counter. That's the other side. They have to deal with inflation, and as a result, there are some consequences. And, but that's going to be front and center, uh, and the market is going to respond one way or the other to that, and uh, we shall see. But uh, right now, inflation is in the crosshairs. Thank you for watching. And if you have comments or questions, you can call me or email me, or you can leave them in the comment section below. If you do um, leave them, I will respond to them. Thank you very much for watching.